rolls to the feet of Mariano Gomez Gutierrez, the putative author, who picks it up, the putative finder of the document, who picks it up and takes it back to his hotel. Quote, on the way back, I thought that maybe among, it, among the packages there might be drafts composed by the people who made the atomic bomb, since it was at, in that university, he's talking about Berkeley, where he lived, that the process of the atom had been analyzed and where they developed the explosive that killed more than 100,000 people in two Japanese cities in 1945, mm -hmm. quicker than a cock's crow. But when he opens the package, he finds that it is, quote, a kind of autobiography of historical events in which the names of the family of the author has been changed in order to avoid any question of self-promotion. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, his own name. Um, the fantasy is revealing. Blas Lara wrote his memoir as an old man in Berkeley, where he had lived since the end of World War I. He published it with an unnamed printer in a cheap edition, bereft of professional copy editing, unlike this book, um, <laughs> leaving his many spelling mistakes as proudly uncorrected as his remarkable prose. Blas Lara's life as a Mexican migrant turned agitator and revolutionary did not leave a mark in Berkeley's monuments or institutions. Instead, Blas imagined encountering its traces, traces near the city limits in the junkyard, where obsolete objects are discarded, dismembered, and recycled. In case the gallows humor of finding the story of his life in a heap of industrial waste did not make his own proletarian marginality sufficiently clear, Blas added a second fantasy to his book's introduction. When Mariano Gomez Gutierrez first takes the ream of paper home, the fictional author of his autobiography, that is, what's in the papers that he supposedly found, um, <clears throat> A, um, excitedly hopes that he's found a relic of the grand and terrible event, the <coughs> invention of the bomb, that tied Berkeley to the history of the world and that first created a common global time by making the biblical idea of Armageddon real. Instead, he finds a curiosity, the convoluted life of a minor figure, a work whose only claim to stylistic merit is that, quote, it has sought to suppress the superfluous verbiage and abstract terms that exist in the work of some professional novelists. As to content, the manuscript's pseudonymous author, who Lara named Edmundo, wishes only to share an account of his life with the modest hope that it will, quote, please the lovers of time spent for the sake of setting an example and of duty accomplished. Despite his keen sense of marginality, however, Blas was not despondent about the significance of his life. He presented it as a contribution to the history of human emancipation albeit in a minor key. Like so many of his comrades, Blas Lara's intimate conviction of the eternal return of revolutionary horizons expressed itself in many ways. One of his daughters was named Floreal, <coughs> anarchist mm. names, uh, after the second month of spring in the French revolutionary <laughs> calendar. Another was Volterine, uh, like American feminist and anarchist Volterine de Clare, and of course after Voltaire himself. His boys, boys were named Orbe and Americo. <laughs> um, the bastard peasant daughter of the Great Revolution, the Mexican Revolution, had spawned the California Spring. But in the two pseudonyms that he used in his memoir, there's also another example of Blas's claims to the persistence of his revolutionary ideals. Mariano Gomez Gutierrez, the document's putative finder, is named after Mariana Gomez Gutierrez, a school teacher <coughs> and colonel in pa Pancho Villa's army who Blas affectionately called Marianita in his personal correspondence. Thus, while Blas Lara's <coughs> pseudonym veiled his own identity, it perpetuated the memory of another, equally minor, revolutionary comrade. The second pseudonym, El Mundo, which means protect protector of victory, invokes, invokes the name of the big-hearted and grievously wronged hero who escaped from prison and returned to society as the mysterious Count of Monte Cristo to savor a most elaborate revenge, bit by deli delicious bit, a 19th century Odysseus. No, stop it. <laughs> if you have any questions for the author or for our presenters, this is the moment. Put it all together, the sources. Um, stumbled upon something. Um, well, 
Um, it, it, it has, uh, there are a number of, uh, the, there, uh, the, the archive of the book is the book itself. Right. But, um, but uh, the, the repositories that I sort of migrated through, um, some of them are widely available, like for example, the Ricardo Flores Magón's uh, uh, letters and uh, in, in, in newspaper articles, his plays, all of that have been uh, collected marvelously by Jacinto uh, Barrera Azores, and they've, they've been published in, in paper edition, and there's also an online archive, which is incredibly uh, useful, wonderful. Um, one of the new, uh, there are some archival repositories that I use that are new, that, that will be open, uh, or that are opening now, like Enrique Flores Magón's papers. Um, and that's a major archival uh, uh, resource <coughs> that I was fortunate to be able to use. Uh, Diego Flores, my one who's the great grandson of Enrique, um, um, gave me access to this, and they're now being put, all of it online. There's a new online archive that, that's going up. All of that will be um, uh, visible. Some of it is, um, for example, Ministry of Foreign Relations in Mexico, because the spying in the United States was being uh, orchestrated through the consulates. So, um, the Ministry of Foreign Relations files has a major repository in Mexico. The National Archives here also have a lot of police and, um, in, in, and diplomatic papers that are, that are relevant. The, a lot of the correspondence uh, that w of the clandestine era is all actually in those foreign relations things because the, the reason why we have the most of them is because of the police. Um, f let's say for a period 1907 to 1909, 1910, <laughs> that's a period where you have that kind of resource. Later, as their importance declines, their presence in the police archives declines somewhat. Prison records in the case of the U.S., uh, you know, Leavenworth prison, uh, all of that. Um, they were in prison, you know, in Leavenworth, in L.A. County <coughs> Jail, at, in Yuma, in, uh, and in McNeil Island. So there's prison records. Um, <coughs> Huntington Library has the papers of some of the members of the socialist circle, which nobody, really, very few people have worked on. They're there, though. Um, and at Berkeley, the Ethel Duffy's papers, which are really important to me, mm -hmm. um, are part in Mexico, where she died, and part in Berkeley, where she studied. And so you have, you have some of them in Nina and some of them in... Um, in, at Berkeley at the Bancroft, like John Murray's papers are also in the, in the Bancroft. Um, so um, what I'd say about Ethel, though, that's fascinating is that John Turner, her, her husband for a while, is the one who became very famous. Everyone who has worked on Turner has worked in Ethel's papers. Nobody really written about Ethel. Ethel is a major figure in lots of ways. I mean, she's a, she's a published novel, she's a poet. Uh, she was the English language editor of Regeneración during like, a key year. I mean, this is not like a minor figure. You know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, so, so some of what I read is stuff that lots of people have read. Mm -hmm. well, Claudio, what about the, there were oral histories that seemed to be on tape, particularly of Ethel Duffy Turner, right? Yeah. That's, that's where, part where of was Berkeley's that, where did project. That go? That, that's where, who did that work? It was, it was at Berkeley. Um, Berkeley had an oral history... I, they may still have it, I'm not sure. An oral history project, this is back in the 60s. Um, and um, uh, there's a woman named Ruth Tizer that did the interviews. Um, and they're, they're there along with her papers, and they're, some of the things that I love, for example, in this book are the story of Carmen. Uh, uh, John Tur Turner risks a lot for the Mexican Revolution, including his life. Um, <coughs> um, and and he, he also runs guns for the Magonistas at the beginning of the revolution. But then when they lose uh, and Madero triumphs, which is after the first, let's say, six months of the revolution when the dictator falls, um, the, the, the group that they had been part of has, been, uh, has had a major rift. And there's all this business of treason that is fundamental. Um, and so at that point, John decides he no longer... He, he's going to just re retire from this stuff, which he does, not permanently, but he, he thinks he's doing it permanently. <coughs> they go live in Carmel. And Carmel at that time is a writer's colony. And there's this marvelous uh, material on Carmel, which also comes from Berkeley's uh, 
the oral history oh, projects because they were interested in, in documenting the rise of Carmel as an, as an artist colony where people like Turner or Upton Sinclair and all these people lived there. Um, so there is important oral history there and there's also important oral history in Mexico in the Ina. Um, not of Ethel but of uh, you know former old revolutionaries, former revolutionaries, maybe the most important I think of these is old, which was Jose Valadez, who was an old uh, his journalist and historian of Mexico, who was in exile too and had these columns in <coughs> Chicano papers in La Opinion, and, and he used to weekly interview uh, revolutionary exiles in San Antonio and in Los Angeles. And uh, they're not technically very, they're not like, let's say, made by the oral history archive in Ina or something, or in, by Berkeley because they're journalistic pieces, but they're, they're journalistic pieces done by quite a serious, um, someone who's seriously concerned with historical accuracy. It's quite, it's quite amazing. Okay. Um, I'm interested in knowing what was your most amazing moment in your archival work. Was there a document that you discovered that you didn't expect? to find, or is there a moment that you remember, especially because it, it had, I don't know, um, you know, it became something very special for you and for the book? Uh, there are a few moments like that, actually. Um, one, for example, is um, one story that's told in the book that I had, knew nothing about and that biographies, biographers of Flores Magón and of this don't write about for some reason, maybe they didn't know about it, I'm not sure is the story of the break between the two brothers, Enrique and Ricardo, mm. uh, which is an extremely bitter moment. And they, they, they break right before they go to prison in 1918. And so they're in prison together and not on speaking terms. Um, and um, uh, at a certain point I found, let's say, a letter by a third person where the pseudonym that was being used that helped crack the whole story was revealed, let's say, because all the correspondence is written from prison, all of the, and, and not only from prison, they, they use a lot of pseudonyms all the time. Right? And so, but sometimes things like that where you know you've been in this thing for so long that you finally, that you know what it is, or identifying photos was also very exciting. The, the book has mm -hmm. about a hundred photos in it, and in fact, mm -hmm. one of the, you know, I really have to thank Columbia for this, because to be honest, it costs like you know, seven, eight thousand dollars to be able to print these. I mean, just for in terms of rights, um, you know, to these various archives. Being able to identify the photos in many cases was a, a source of pride and excitement because I, I think many people don't know what they are. Do you mind? Sorry. No. I'm, I'm I, I just, have a question. Okay, just, I just wanted to, to, because, you know, some of the questions here, I just wanted to show this image, and if you don't mind, I would like to read the caption, and in the understanding that what you are going to listen to is a caption, okay? Right. Figure 16-1. One. one of the rags used by Ricardo Flores Magón to write to, Marie, to Maria Bruce, photographed by the Mexican consul in Los Angeles and sent to Mexico's Minister of Foreign Affairs. Dialectical image. Purloined yeah. photos yeah. of purloined letters are presented here <laughs> as a memento mori, both of the tragic hero and the government spy. At one level, they are icons of the futility of the hero's pains and the restless guile of his oppressors. But at another level, they are tokens of a heroic beauty that can never be apprehended. <laughs> they bring to mind the inevitable death of both the revolutionary hero and the secret serviceman. <laughs> Archivo Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores, <laughs> Mexico City. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just, just. <laughs> well, I just wanted to, to ask you if you could... Uh, speak a little bit about Elizabeth, uh, because I, uh, when I mentioned her, you know, she was a very, she came from a very wealthy family in Boston, and one of those characters that I discovered in this book, I knew nothing about her, and gave up uh, her wealth, invested, uh, funded the movement, uh, married uh, with uh, one of the 
the anarchists, to one of the anarchists, and then they went to London, and from there she, they did a wonderful, uh, they continued to support the revolution in France too, with the French and, and the British, and she dies in absolute poverty in Brooklyn in 1930s, mm. uh, in a Puerto Rican family, which is that ending, I was very touched by that. Mm. That she's uh, and totally forgotten. Is that the case? No, absolutely, totally forgotten. I mean, and not only forgotten when she's remembered, she's uh, mangled horribly. Like, mm. for example, um, her name is consistently <coughs> misspelled almost always if she is remembered. Um, and then sometimes, like one of the historians who I admire, but uh, from like the '60s, uh, Low Blaisdell, who wrote a very good book about the revolution in Baja California that was important in this, uh, sort of accuses her of being a, a, you know, a, 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 a hysteric. He's talking about um, um, the supporters of the of the anarchists, and and he says, and some of them were, you know, sort of wealthy female malcontents and hysterics, and the, the, he, d he doesn't name her, but she's the only one. But, I mean, this, what, what Renato said about um, the supporters and who they were, um, it's, it's a complicated story. There were, yes, Irish, there were Italians, very important Italian, Italian unions. Um, uh, during a certain moment, Regeneración puts out uh, an Italian language page along with its English language page because of the significance of the Italians. Jews, lots of Jews. I mean, you have when they when Ricardo dies, they have a small um, funeral in Los Angeles. Not so small, but small compared to the multitudinous ones in Mexico. This is at the time still when when you know the repression of anarchists and socialists uh, was still you know very close in the U.S., so the, the size in the, of, the, of the rallies in the U.S. was not the, si the same as in Mexico, but it was still pretty big. Um, they sing in the end, which they always did in these anarchist things, the Marseillaise, right? And, um, and they sing the Marseillaise in English, Spanish, Italian, and Yiddish. <laughs> and so, um, um, so there's there is the working class immigrant thing. Blas Lara, for example, is secretly convinced he's a peasant and initially from the state of Jalisco. He's convinced that he's Jewish, and because he's been working on these lumber mills in uh, in northern California with these Russian immigrants, who, who he feels very much at home with. So he has this, and because they're all deeply anti-clerical, of course, they're all these are people who want to sort of you know burned a lot of them, kind of, I mean, you know, the nuns and, the, you know, all of that. So the Jews, you know, it's, it's better, you know, he thinks, maybe I come from somewhere else, you know, <laughs> can't stand these other guys. You know. So, um, but then there is this, this um, component that is um, either wealthy or in any case established, uh, and Elizabeth and John Murray are the, the most important examples of that, and she's from a very rich Bostonian family. She went to Radcliffe, and um, um, and then and and her her mother and is a is a member of the Socialist Party. She's also uh, a Theosophist, the, the usual kind of cocktail of the era. You know, she's a she's an astrologer. She's a well, my kind of person. I mean, <laughs> she likes you know, cards and uh, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, and she's a and she's member of the Socialist Party. Her mother takes her to Europe, tries to, you know, uh, accuse, uh, mm -hmm. threatens her with disinheriting her, and in the end kind of leaves her in Los Angeles, where she forms part of this circle of socialists. And she bankrolls, you know, the whole defense of the Flores Magons in, in 1909, 1910. The trips by Murray and by John Turner, which the, the Turner trip in particular really changed American opinion on Diaz, which was critical for the revolution, for the revolution's success. Uh, all this she, she financed, and uh, she financed all kind. She financed guns, gun running, all that. Uh, she marries Manuel Saravia, who is one of the prisoners, uh, um, one of these anarchists, and then they go to exile to uh, because he, he, she gets him out of jail on bail, and they run out to uh, uh, to England where she continues with the militancy, then they go to Mexico once Madero wins. Um, and then when Madero falls, they come back to the U.S., to New York, where Saravia dies. 
but she's then disinherited from her family. She goes to live in, comes to live in New York. She lives uh, in Brooklyn, and uh, basically sort of starves. I mean, um, during the depression, and that's the end of her story. She died of malnutrition. Yeah. Yes, Christina. Thinking about Arcadia's comment about sad and melancholy towards the end of the book, um, revolutionary hero, um, armed struggle, comrade, these words have been thrown around. How is it for you kind of returning to the, in a way, the point of entanglement of these um, revolutionary projects, of this mm -hmm. political imaginary from the standpoint of today, where so many of those projects have either reach some sort of impasse or considered by many even obsolete. How was it going back, I guess, effectively, ideologically to this to this moment? Yeah. I'm still not sure how to answer that. I mean, I think that's kind of what I was groping for the whole book, uh, during the whole book. A, a, I think part of it is <coughs> that I'm, I'm very much convinced that this era that era that I'm writing about there, and I've been writing about this era before I wrote it with my brother a play on Bulnes, who was a, a, a conservative uh, intellectual of this period, a little bit older. I've been working on this period for some time. I think that the contemporary history of Mexico sort of, I, 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 I know this is going to sound like, you know, completely again, like uh, the theosophist. Um, <laughs> uh, all of the keys are there. Um, I think that is the point where you would want to start in order to understand <coughs> what we have now, in part because the process of uh, so-called neoliberal transition, let's say of the 1980s in the case of Mexico, um, has all this deep resonance with this, the rift that happened there. Uh, so, uh, the resonance, uh, you know, may be concocted, it comes, may come in as specter, it may or may not be justified or justifiable, but it's there. Um, uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that this is a, a group that has a deep uh, critique of the state. I mean, with all of the, and that's something that I think we need. Well, the good news is that we can continue this conversation <laughs> with some wine and some tapas here. And please, by all means, join in. And thank you very much for. Thank you.